I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. Welcome to Blast Off. And welcome to another episode of the Blast Off Podcast. This will be one of our conversation shows. It's an interesting thing watching writers who come in and out of comics. Because there are writers who are amazing novelists and can't really crack how to do comics. And there are comics writers who are just some of the best writers around. And you don't see them doing novels. I'm one of those guys. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a great comic book writer, but... I know my strength and my weaknesses. I'm a sprinter. I'm good for short stories. Prose, long form, I just I don't feel like I got the legs for it. And every now and then you get a guy who can do both, who can come in and just tell great serialized comic book stories and go off and crank out an amazing novel. Greg Hurwitz is one of those guys. Yeah, I've read a lot of Greg's novels. He's you know, he's a good friend, but as a creator, he is what I would call relentless. This is a guy who is dedicated to get up, go to work. Right. That's what he's all about. And whether it's comics or novels or screenplays or television, get up, go to work. And writing is writing. You just deal with the format. Quite frankly, I think writers like him used to exist more often than they do now. In the old days. Yeah. You had writers who were playwrights who, you know, had Pulitzer Prize winning novels yeah. and had these award winning plays and they'd fly to California and write this Oscar winning screenplay and then they'd go back to writing poetry. Right. That's what you did. So you go back even further, guys like Mickey Spillane who were writing like a nickel a word. That's right. And you would find them on like lists of guys who were writing for Marvel before they were Marvel back in the 40s. Hmm. I, I think Mario Puzo is one of those lists too. I would hazard a guess to say that the creation of comic book pulp came from novelists, not comic book writers. The inspiration came from novelists. Yeah. And now it's interesting that we have guys like Greg who are going from the prose format into the nine panel grids and comfortable with it. <laughs> but I mean, look what he's right. Yeah. You know, Punisher, Wolverine, Batman. Yeah. And it's got to be said, it is Greg who's responsible for both of our only appearances in the DC universe. That time that <laughs> officers Myers and Tipton got dropped in an issue of Detective Comics, <laughs> which I quite enjoyed. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. He loves putting his friends in and killing them. <laughs> he, he does that as his novels. Too. I was like, oh, I went down so easy. <laughs> Yeah, he's a fascinating man who came from such an interesting background. He's a scholar, Shakespearean scholar. And I really do think that he has a lot to offer, not just about his storytelling, but also about his technique, what I like to call mechanics, the mechanics of Greg Hurwitz. Let's get to it. Today's guest is the best-selling author of 17 novels. His work has been published in over 30 languages. He's written screenplays for every major studio and developed and produced work for every major TV network. You might have seen that spooky sci-fi revival of V a few years back. Yeah, that's him. And he's working on an HBO series adaptation of Pulitzer Prize winner Joby Warwick's book about the formation of ISIS, with Bradley Cooper and Todd Phillips also on board. His original screenplay, The Book of Henry, directed by Colin Trevorrow, yes, Star Wars Colin Trevorrow, recently wrapped shooting in New York with a cast that includes Naomi Watts, Sarah Silverman, Lee Pace, and Dean Norris. And if that wasn't enough for you, he's the New York Times best-selling author of some of the most badass Batman, Punisher, and Wolverine comics you'll ever get your hands on. His novel, Orphan X, came out last year and was immediately grabbed up by Bradley Cooper. They're currently developing it for a feature film franchise. Right now, he's on a worldwide tour promoting the follow-up Evan Smoke book, The Nowhere Man. He was kind enough to carve out some time in the studio with us, somewhere between Arizona and New Zealand. Please welcome the sharp shock of an author that goes by the name Greg Hurwitz. Greg Hurwitz. 
Greg, thanks for joining us on the Blast Off podcast. I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate you joining us uh, from your whirlwind tour that you just started. Where did you just get back from? Uh, last stop was Palo Alto. Okay, and yeah. what's the next stop? Uh, next is going to be New Zealand and Australia. Psh, that's nothing. Man. I know. You're just going to like take a bus or something. Yeah, I hit. I did. I, I just finished the city a day leg, so I went. You know, L.A., Phoenix, Houston, Vegas, San Jose, Palo Alto here. I'll go further east once I'm back, but I, I dip back through town just to see you, Judd. Thanks so much, man. Yeah. And you like kill it in San Paulo or something like that. You're, like, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're big in San Paulo. It's been a really fun run. Well, you and I have known each other a long time, so this is sort of great for me to have you on this new venture that we have with this podcast. Well, it's great for me too, man. Um, so jumping in, I'd say in the middle, but really it's sort of 75% in. We're here talking about Nowhere Man, uh, the new Evan Smoke novel, which is a sequel to Orphan X, your uh, lightning fast runaway success. And all of your books have been really great. New York Times bestseller is shortlisted for all these awards. But this one, for some reason, this one and this character has hit so many people worldwide that it's just a fast outbreak as soon as it dropped. You know, what is it? What do you think it's, it is about this character? It's different. Well, it was pretty crazy. I mean, it came out and, you know, in pretty short order, we were in 20 languages. I mm. mean, it just sort of took off. And readers connected with Evan Smoke as Orphan X in a way they never have. And, and I think part of that is I waited so long to do a big series mm. like this. And, you know, at the end of the day, I spend more time with my characters, more waking hours than I do with my own family. And so it's like, I better like the guy. I better like the woman if I have a female protagonist. And so it took me a long time to zero in on this character and there's something just that I think I arrived at him so genuinely and people just really connected with him. Mm. Like I'm, I got the whole feedback in and around him is different. And, you know, I think part of it might be that it's sort of the setup, right? So here's this guy who's pulled out of a foster home at the age of 12 and trained up in this black ops program to be, you know, an off the books assassin. Mm. But then he leaves. He's got all these dichotomies so he his moral compass isn't broken when he's in there so he right. leaves and basically now he's a pro bono assassin which mm. i don't think is something we've ever seen <laughs> you know he i always have the strong vigilante theme in my work which you're well aware of in of comics course. and yep. novels yeah and so i think there's something about him because he's incredibly tough he's incredibly driven he's trained up better than anyone ever has been but he's got this part of him that's intact that sort of craves intimacy and so for me i think a lot of what people respond to is we see him in the real world. He goes into these unbelievable operations, but he lives in the world that you and I do. And so we, one thing we never get to see is we don't get to see James Bond go home. We don't get to see Jason Bourne like stuck in the elevator with some you know, neighbor yelling at him that he didn't go to his HOA meeting. Right. And so it's that movement back and forth between all the badassery and then the life that we recognize and knowing how tough he is, but he's covering it up and moving in the same world that we move in. That seems to really appeal to people. Well, I think there's some connection here because you've written Batman and, uh, you know, novelists, people who read thrillers, you know, crime noir, adventure, not all of them read comic books, but everybody knows who Batman is. And Batman's sort of the, you know, the biggest character in comics. You know, he sells more than everybody else. And it hits, it strikes a chord with readers across DC and Marvel. Everybody's talked about Jack Reacher. Everybody's talked about these, you know, all of these characters that appear like Bob Crace's books that, you know, appear in rotation in novels. But this character is like Bruce Wayne. There's something about the origin of this character. You say, you know, what's it like for Jack Reacher in the HOA meeting? We see Bruce Wayne in his alone in his mansion. And we see Bruce Wayne in his Wayne Enterprises in these boring board meetings. But we never see Bruce Wayne sort of talking to the gardener. Somebody's got to take care of right. Wayne Manor. And it ain't Alfred because he can't, you know, he's not out there doing the gardening too. Yeah, Alfred doesn't pick up the dry cleaning. <laughs> right, as far as we know. Um, but the idea that. Bruce Wayne would go on his way to Wayne Enterprises and not say hello to the gardener and ask how his family is, is ludicrous. Of well, course and, he's going to do that. And that's the heart of it in, in a weird way is when, when I was writing Batman, one of the things I was obsessed with is this sort of, and I think this is maybe 
a personal thing that I'm always tr- kind of trying to resolve is that balance of the draw toward perfectionism and intimacy. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why Bruce Wayne works so well, why Batman's so amazing, one of the things I love about him, as is often said, he doesn't have a magic ring. He can't fly. He mm-hmm. represents the height of human discipline at, applied. Right. But why he can do that is because he doesn't have intimacy. His parents are dead. He doesn't have a long-term relationship. He doesn't have kids as much as that, you know, the relationship with Robin over the years. I mean, there's, we've alluded to it. I gave him a girlfriend in, in Dark Knight Run. Right. Um, but he's, he's large in a way alone. And so for me with, and I was really interested in that because the more intimacy you allow in your life, the more mess, right? right. The more vulnerability. And if you want to be perfect, it really helps if you're just up in your manner and you're alone and all you have to do is train and fighting and languages and focus on tack you can't right. do it with you know you look at me i got kids i got two giant dogs you know the dog gets sick this happens the more intimacy you allow around you the more mess and that's what makes life interesting and amazing which is why robin keeps dying i know poor guy <laughs> he just he's yeah he's got the longevity of a kennedy male it's just not it doesn't it's bad news um but you know, and so part of it for me was with Evan, I th- and I think this is something else people relate to. It's like he was trained up. He's got all these credentials, but he's got this draw to live among people. So he mm-hmm. lives in this high rise, you know, residential tower off the Wilshire Corridor among people. And it's almost like he's got his face up to the glass looking in at these people living ordinary lives that he himself could never live. And his mm-hmm. life is devoted to protecting, you know, the people who are truly desperate, who want to live ordinary lives. And he protects them. In some ways, his penance for past missions, but in some ways, that's what he wants. And so, you know, there's a single mother, she's widowed, who's a DA who lives downstairs from him called Mia. She's got a a, a young son who he's very fond of, and he's like in the elevator with them, and he's trying to figure out, he lacks the language of intimacy. He lacks mm-hmm. the language of, of conversation. He's totally at home in war zones on missions, but he's at a complete loss if he's stopped in the hallway and someone's trying to make small talk around something, you know, <laughs> and inevitably he's like bleeding through his sleeve from a knife fight he was just in. So there is a lot of overlap with the comics. And that's the thing that that I played with a lot is like, what if the mission and all of your training and your DNA and all the commandments that you live by put you at odds from a fundamental need to be around people? And that's a there's a, a, a tension at the core of him that's that's always going to be there. Yet, like a superhero, there is a, a mission, but it's it, you know it's mission by mission by mission, person by person case. And this guy, um, you know, it's it's a card with a number on it, and the person who needs help, you know, gets help. And then the net, he has he or she has to give that card to the next person who has a big problem, and they call the number. Yep, you got something running, some kind of PR thing that's going. It's a, there's a card, there's a number one eight five five, the number two nowhere and you call that phone number i'm not going to tell you what happens just call the number one eight five five the number two nowhere crazy little viral thing that you're that you're doing so this character anything could happen of course it sets it up in a very cinematic way even a you know episodic way because you never know who it's going to be next like you know an equalizer kind of thing but in the second book in nowhere man You do that thing where everybody expects, okay, the second book is like, who's next that needs to be saved? And you go, well, he does. You take him and you get, you cage him. You, you you take him away. Yeah. It's about him escaping. Well, I really wanted to turn. So Orphan X came out and just sort of took off and it was, it was great. It's like that dream. The hope that I had was that he would connect with readers the way that he did with Mm -hmm. Evan Smoke. But then when it comes to writing a sequel, you know, a lot of the guys who I admire a lot, like Lee Child, you mentioned Robert mm-hmm. Grace, um, their 10th book is as fresh as the first one. <laughs> and so it's like there's this high bar I set, which is this is a series. I don't want it to be another chapter, another installation. And so at the end of the day, I really wanted to turn reader expectations for what they were expecting on their head. I wanted to even maybe turn my own expectations to keep it really interesting. Right. And so sure enough, you know, there's this guy who – doesn't know who Evan is, but manages to capture him. A guy with virtually limitless resources. And Evan's knocked out and he wakes up from, you know, he's unconscious and he comes to, he's in this remote, luxurious chateau surrounded with guards. And the guy who's taken him wants something from him. And the guy has no idea that he is Orphan X. He has no idea who he is. There's something very specific. 
And so it's set up in this way where... He's kidnapped Batman. Exactly. <laughs> without knowing it. <laughs> And so he basically is thinking, you know, well, we have him trapped in here with me and all my guards. And what they're soon going to realize is that they, in fact, are trapped in there with Orphan X. Mm. Wow. That calls calls back to Watchmen and Rorschach in the in the prison. Right. Um, it's sort of like, oh, no. Yeah. It's something terrible is going to happen. So I also want to touch on a few other things. Um, and for all of you out there who haven't read a lot of Greg's comic book work, Penguin, Pain, and Prejudice is absolutely a phenomenal comic book miniseries. I suggest you check it out because it really turns the idea of villain, the type of villain uh, that he is on its head um, and makes him truly scary in many different ways. And check out his Wolverine work, his Punisher work, great stuff on Punisher. This whole idea of your protagonists, it, there's always a, you start your books with this question like someone a crime writer this crime writer wakes up doesn't remember how the hell he got there and he's on top of a dead woman okay you set up a scenario and here's this guy who has to like create a crime book in order to figure out what the hell happened to him and save his own life okay uh, uh, the phone rings and there's someone on the other end a package arrives and there's something inside you go out onto the balcony and all of a sudden these you know military guys show up and spirit you away do you just start with this this crazy badass idea do you know the end of your book are you is this do you start with the end of the story knowing what the end of the story is and then you basically are you know mad dash to the finish well it's sort of in between i know there's this big discussion among novelists like are you do you plot do you outline do you not outline i'm right in between at a certain point in my, I wrote my first book. I had no idea what the hell I was doing, which was evidenced by the end of the rough draft. I mean, I was a 19 year old kid <laughs> typing, you know, and doing it badly. And I finished it. And then was I was before or after college. Like you went to Oxford, you oh, studied was, Shakespeare. You... This was during college when okay. I was writing the tower, my first book. And then I finished and it was a mess. I mean, like literally the end of every chapter was better than the beginning from what I'd learned as I was writing the chapter. Right. I mean, there's no way to learn how to write a novel unless you're doing it and screwing it up. Right. And so when I was done, I took the whole thing apart, like an engine block chapter by chapter and then kind of rebuilt it. And mm. I'd say there was a process, my first, you know, seven, eight books where I outlined more and more and more. But I got to a point where I had an outline, I remember, of 75 pages, and I realized when I was writing the book, I knew all the twists and turns that I was bored. If I'm bored when I'm writing it, they're going to be bored when they're reading it. And so I went to this really weird format where I usually have all these ideas of scenes, dialogue, character, action, all this stuff. It's in a big file. You know, It's usually 20 to 35 pages of bullet points before I start. I usually know the run of the opening. Mm. It just occurs to me. I always have like a big, fast, action-y opening. Or a suspenseful opening. And then as I write, I keep fiddling with the outline, you know, as I go. So it's kind of living and breathing. And I keep shaping up chapters and runs of narrative out of the kind of clay of these bullet points. And mm. I keep massaging it and massaging it as I go. The only difference is, is as I write forward, I'm deleting from it. As I'm writing it, it's getting absorbed into the book. And at the end, I have a 400-page manuscript on one screen of my, I got two big monitors. Right. And on the other one, it's empty. And then I delete it. And then you have like a graveyard of keyboards because you <laughs> pound on your keyboards. I do. I've seen it happen. <laughs> hey, you're on the phone. You're looking at the screen. And pow, 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 yeah. pow, pow. My keyboards are loud. <laughs> My friends, when I'm on the phone, if I'm typing, always joke that I sound like a like a travel agent who can't get you the flight that you want. You know, they're like, let me check that for you, sir. <laughs> oh, nope. We're going to have to route you through Detroit. It's like that's – they're loud. I always want – I feel like I'm – a carpenter. I mean, I feel like I'm banging and hammering away at stuff. So I need mm. a keyboard that makes me feel that has a physical presence to it. You're a lot like Harlan Ellison in that, you know, Harlan, he writes on a, an old keyboard that mm -hmm. one, two fingers peek, 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 yeah. with carbon copies. But if you walk into his house and he's working on it and way in the other room, it's like thunderous. And the reason why he likes it isn't just the sound, but he can hit it so hard yeah. and the thing is not going to break. It's sort of masculine. It's aggressive. And it that's what he writes. That's yeah. what he's always done. He sure does. So I want to get back to, first of all, just 
leap back a little bit. A lot of people know about your past as a scholar, and they know about... Well, I'm your... more of a dilettante than a scholar. <laughs> well, you've written papers on Iago and you know the villains of the Shakespearean villains. And here you are writing... You write a lot of characters who are right on the edge. Are they good? Are they bad? You're not really sure. They do bad things, but you can't help but sympathize with them. That's a very Shakespearean idea. Most interesting characters in Shakespeare the villains. You, you can't help but be drawn to them, but you also can't help but sympathize with them. And the greatest actors who perform these, these plays make you sympathize with them because you can't watch a three or four hour show hating someone just going, I just can't look at this anymore. Just as you can't read a 300 page novel and go, I just, there's nothing, there's nothing to like about this. There's no way in. So do you start with the good or do you start with the bad or you like whatever comes out first? Typically, we see your characters doing something bad first before they're doing something good, before we go, oh, OK, I OK, I can like this guy. Well, it's funny. So one of the main questions that I get asked is, you know, why does a Shakespeare, a guy who studied Shakespeare, I did sort of Jungian analysis of Shakespearean narrative. I only did it because I liked it. You know, in hindsight, it's the perfect training to write thrillers, right? Because what are the tragedies? They're highly structured, narrative-driven tales of lust, intrigue, and murder <laughs> that are convention-based, right? They're strong convention. So, you know, the Jew of Malta becomes the merchant of Venice. Mm -hmm. It's playing with a form that everybody already recognizes and trying to do amazing things within that form. And the other thing, of course, in tragedy is that the flaw of the character – the central flaw that brings about the negative circumstances is always inherent to the character himself. That's right. the tragic flaw. And so for me, it's like the person has to make a choice to open one moral misstep that opens the door to unforeseen consequences, mm. right? That's very like Hitchcocky in every man. It doesn't have to be an equivalent reaping of the whirlwind, but they have to do something wrong. And one of the things that's interesting, I think I've learned over the years, because I've been doing this for a long time now, is that a lot of times the things that are the weaknesses and the flaws in the character are the things that make us like them. So I think maybe when I was younger and I was writing characters, it was always, I wanted them to be the best of the best. And it's like, no one likes the best of the best, right? <laughs> you like the guy who, like, you know, Evan will have some just awkward mishandling of a social situation because he was raised off the books in like a, a broke foster home. And, you know, and then he came up with all this meticulous training. He doesn't know how to interact properly and he'll be inadvertently like rude to a kid or to a woman and reflect on it afterwards. And a lot of times those are the things that make us like and relate to people. Mm. We make mistakes all the time. So again, on that balance of perfection versus intimacy, he's so perfectly trained as an assassin. He's extraordinarily well-trained, but I think as he's tentatively trying to venture into intimacy, which is a field in which he doesn't speak the language perfectly, that's something we can all relate to immensely. Like how many of us haven't had problems trying to figure out how to contend with intimacy, contend with interactions and relationships, and do you say the wrong thing? Do you, do you... But he's also, when he's tough and when someone deserves it, he's Frank Castle. Like right. he's not messing around. And like, I don't mind that, you know, it's Shakespeare, Greeks, and definitely comic books. We talk a lot about the morality tales that they are the good versus evil, same story over and over told in a different way. But at the same time, we root for our heroes, certainly in comics, you know, Logan, you know, Wolverine, we go, we want him to make the good choice and to, and to be a good guy and, and save people as hero. But then when he goes to kill the bad guy, we go, yeah, kill him. Like, absolutely, you got to kill him. Mm -hmm. We have the, that in us, too. We have the bad in our heart. And we want, we want the bad guy to get their comeuppance for what they've done. And these characters, like characters you write, they give us a way to do it without actually doing it ourselves. Right. We There's can, a lot of vicarious yes. fun to be had. Right. And, and, that, and we that, all want to be... We all want to be able to shoot these guns and do this physical stuff and beat the hell out of people and not be afraid if somebody tries to throw a punch at us. Well, that's the fun of all my research is I go do all that stuff, except I can be afraid <laughs> when I'm doing it. You know, I mean, I, I got on every gun that Evan shoots. I mean, I have a buddy who's an armorer, so I, I can get on any weapon. You know, I mm. fly out to him. I want to really know and do the research. Did mixed martial arts fighting? I mean, not well, like, you know, just reintroducing my face to the mat over and over again. 
being pounded. And part of why I do this, I've always done this. You know, I've gone undercover in a mind control cult. Mm -hmm. I've snuck on a demolition ranges with seals and blown up cars. I mean, I've, I've done all order of stupid stuff in the name of research. But part of why I do it is I want I want the readers to have a front row seat to the action. And if I don't go do it myself, I don't always find the little telling details that make something different from every other thriller or TV show or movie that you've seen, right? right. Cause a lot of us have this, we're, we're so sophisticated as pop culture consumers. Now we know a lot, but if I actually go and have try and do mixed martial arts fighting badly, there's a sensation when you're getting choked out and you're on the verge of going unconscious. If that happens to me, I can write about it in a way that's different than just what I think from seeing it. <laughs> well, in that way you're a lot like an actor who will do that kind of research. A lot of writers, because they have such great imaginations, don't actually go out and do that. And certainly it is a little bit easier for you because you're a fit guy. You're not, you know, you're not sort oh, of- go on. An, <laughs> an over, you know, you're just going to have to take my word for it out there. This is audio only. I can yeah, be, exactly. I can be whoever. I He's can, like 300 I'm pounds. I'm like a young like. Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're, if you're a writer who's sort of, okay, I'm in my 60s and I have bad knees and I'm, you know, but I'm writing about, these crazy characters who do all of this physical stuff, you really have to use your imagination. Mm -hmm. You're doing this stuff because you can, and obviously you want to, but I think it informs your work. I think it's a way in a way that other writers may not have the ability to do. Well, thank you. I mean, it's also, I'm also aware that it's, that my contribution to it is, or not my contribution, but my participation is at a very, shallow level meaning like i can go get on an assault shotgun at a range i mm. can get on a sniper rifle i've done all this right i've been on mp5s none of it is in a real condition right none of it is it's not game time right. nothing's live you know and even with the mixed martial arts it's like i'm not getting in any cages what i'm trying to do is just get enough experience to to kind of get an angle on it from people who are the real deal mm. And that's true for professors. And I mean, I have the weirdest Rolodex. It's like, you know, porn stars, professors, <laughs> army rangers, meteorologists. I, I mean, there, it becomes so odd because of all these experts. And so what I try and do is not waste their time when I'm around them. It's sort of like when Evan's training, you know, his his handler, whose name is Jack Johns. There's a lot of comic book names in the, which we should <laughs> yeah, maybe run through because a lot of people don't get a lot of them. <laughs> but the key to me is what you know jack says you're gonna learn a little bit about everything from people who know everything about a little bit mm. like so it's like people who know have one specialty it's sort of like me you know I, i'm trying to learn a bit about a lot of fields from people that that's all they do but the names in there are funny i just not everyone got them there's two thugs who get beat up in orphan x you know one's called mike martz the other's called axel alonzo <laughs> and those were my only two editors I ever had, one at Marvel and one at, at DC, you know, good buddies. So I turned them into thugs and had them get beat up. And of course, the the, the kind of nemesis for Orphan X in my book is Charles Van Skyver. <laughs> and, you know, when I worked with Ethan on Batman, I was like, dude, you have the best last name I've ever heard of. And I, I'm going to use it, you know. You, you're going to have to like, become Go. a villain. Yeah, you're going to be a villain. You're going to be horrible. <laughs> he loves that, too. <laughs> rubbing his his hands with glue but there's other stuff like you know even jack johns was is a bit of a hat tip to jeff and right. you know it's so there's stuff that threads through that's a lot of fun that's great you have these two different worlds that are slowly coming together i think you have comic book people who are starting to go i need to read these novels and you know they don't have pictures in them but boy they're really good and then you have all these people who read novels that are going maybe i should read comics i mean geez if he's writing Batman, I might as well kind of have a look at that. Yeah. And, you know, it's like I haven't written anything new in comics for a, a little stretch now. And it's, but, you know, I don't care what the delivery mechanism is for a good story. I mean, I don't right. care if you inject it or snort it. I just, you know, it's all about, <laughs> it's all about having the best, most compelling story. So it's funny because if something occurs to me, I'll think, you know, is, is this a novel? Is this a screenplay? Is it mm -hmm. a TV show? Is it a comic? I mean, so there's, and I think what you always want is you want to maximize the form that you're writing in. I think with Evan Smoke, with with Orphan X and with The Nowhere Man, it was the first time that I felt like I can do this lane for a good long time. That's mm -hmm. what you need for a series. This is, you know, and I've, I've worked on the adaptation. I've adapted it for uh, over at Warner Brothers now. And, and you know, that's, that's moving forward in the development process. Um, with Bradley nicely. Cooper. Yeah. And... 
it's been good, but it's but really looking at it, it's like you know, for my novelist space, I can I want to live here in the sandbox for a while. So the third one is being written or third already one's being written. written. Yeah, Orphan X was out. It was only out two weeks, and my publisher called here in the UK, where are my two probably biggest publishers called, and we're like, we want to just take you out through twenty twenty, hmm. like get kind of hit a nerve, and let's just lock you up. So for three more so i was way ahead i mean i was still two weeks into touring for orphan x when i knew there would be five of them wow oh wow yeah that's a big commitment yeah but that that phone call also doesn't suck to get right of course <laughs> like oh okay i well, just want to touch on you the the relationship with publishers you go my publisher you're looking at all of your work you'll have like five books with a specific publisher and then five or six books with a totally different publisher. Is it a deal that you make? Hey, I'll do the next five or six with you. Or is it like, I like these people and I'll keep going. Five or six, you don't generally do, or I haven't. I mean, first you're writing on spec. I mean, I wrote my first four novels on spec, which means I spent a year writing eight to 10 hours a day. Mm. I wrote less then because I had kind of less lanes, but I was still writing all day, every day. And at the end of the year, you hope you can sell it because, right. you know, I didn't have a track record and I wasn't known, but that's a long time to be writing. Imagine doing that for a full, I mean, the first, and the first books took longer. I mean, my second book took me two and a half years to write. The first one I wrote over however long, cause I wrote it from like 19, I think I sold it. I was 22 or 23. I got, I got really lucky and sold that. Um, but you're spending all of your time full time writing a product that you hope you kind of pull a winning lottery ticket. Mm. And so by the time I got to my fourth novel was the first time they said, this is good and, we, and we'll take the next one, whatever it is. So that was the first time I had a two book deal and then a two book deal. I've been with the same um, editor now for the last seven, well, last eight books, including The Nowhere Man. And he's great here. And with England, I'm, I'm with uh, Penguin UK. I mm -hmm. mean, so they move around. I mean, I have 20 editors. Yeah, I mean, I'm in 30 languages, but Orphan X is in 20. So some, you know, some of them catch up late or they're still translating something in Estonia or something, you know, let's so. hope the translation is good. Cause you're not going to know I'm powerless. <laughs> I'm powerless before my translator. So I always feel like if I get bad reviews in other languages, I can always just blame the translator. Like, <laughs> no, it was all gold on this end. You know, you know, I know that your family, a lot of doctors in your family, you say that you grew up, you know, with some pretty graphic stuff that was thrown around. So now it's like pretty easy for you. If you see a part body part or you hear something that's happening, you're like, okay, yeah. So he cut them here and then, uh, okay, got it. There's a, you know, vein that he hid and then blood came out and all right, it's easier for you. You have sort of a thick skin when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. And I have the weird thing that I bet you had and a lot of your listeners have. Cause if, if people are in a, if people are tuned into a comic, podcasts like you're we're all in the same weird club you mm -hmm. know i mean i was watching jaws and all the horror movies in seventh grade sixth seventh grade i was reading stephen king in fifth grade like under the bed terrified flashlight reading salem's lot mm. so i always had that draw to it too you know so it was I, I like things that are macabre i like things that that are very suspenseful i mean that's what calms me which mm -hmm. is super weird i remember when i was first dating my wife I'm not a good sleeper, so I couldn't sleep. And what I used to do when I couldn't sleep is I'd get up and I'd watch Silence of the Lambs, and then I could sleep really well after. It's like I need some you're just, kind of... You're weird, man. I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I bet a lot of people listening can relate to this. Like, I'm watched the... You know, at night, I'm watching The Fall or Game of Thrones right, or, right. you know, darker stuff. And for some reason, that's kind of... I don't know. It's like, that's what I find engaging, and it, it's calming and contentment making no i remember there was a time you called me up and you're like hey, hey my agent's screening this really dark bloody horror movie it's totally gross let's go and you were like sure <laughs> yeah what time sounds, should i go sounds good exactly <laughs> and that was sinister i think oh yeah it was, it was uh, early yeah <laughs> i love that stuff so Sorry. physicians a lot of doctors a lot of lawyers a lot of people who took the hippocratic oath yes so first do no harm mm -hmm. so you're growing up with that idea which is connected to morality and also definitely connected to the superhero world you are you create these characters that are sort of rooted in doing bad things but trying to save people trying to help them eventually they just want to keep them alive i don't know that there's any connection but it seems like a doctor can can do a lot of bad things to a body 
but the whole idea is to keep it going and and make sure that it it stays alive and save somebody. Um, essentially, you grew up with some superheroes at the table. Yeah, and I, it's interesting that you say that because I think ethics and morality play a really big role in my writing. And so for me, there's there was a key moment. That the whole series for me or the whole character of Evan Smoke coalesces around and that so he was pulled out, as I mentioned, of the foster home at the age of 12. And one of the things that I thought was, well, what if instead of this being like the horrible nightmare story, what if his handler was really great and loved him like a father? And was hard on him. But what if they had a great relationship? So instead of doing the whole thing that it's just tortured and brutal and he was, you know, never respected and turned into a weapon. And so he has the Ten Commandments he lives by that are all mission related that Jack Johns gave him, his handler. But there's this moment where Jack says to him when he's younger, he says, the hard part isn't turning you into a killer. The hard part is keeping you human. And I thought that's the whole series. That's the whole deal. Because if he had just turned him into a pure killer... It would have been way easier for Evan, but that would have made him a lot less like you and me to mm-hmm. relate to. He would have had an easier life. He would have not had a moral compass to worry whether it was broken or not. He would have done his missions. He wouldn't have ever had to leave the program and do pro bono work and help people and be tortured and try and figure out and know he wants to be in the world a certain way around mm-hmm. real people, but he can't because he's got a job and a code that takes him away from it. That would have been a lot simpler. And so I think the ethics of that are really important to me is like what how how do you raise someone right? How do you teach someone to be human? How do you teach someone? You know, there's a, there's a scene. It's really funny because I got called in to do a, um, a podcast uh, that was against um, abuse against women because mm. there's a there's a scene where Jack talks to Evan about how he will treat women. And he relates it's all these things that are mission essential. He says you will do it because it's it's because it's morally correct, but you'll also do it because you know equality of women is the biggest predictor of you know the economic and political success of any country. So it's also mission <laughs> imperative. It's like oh the, man, here here's why we will respect women from levels top to bottom. Like first of all, it's just right. Second, you know, and Evans like sixteen, you know, so it's there's this really interesting backdrop of it of like how do you raise a good human? How do you raise a good man? You know, Mm. normally there's a good woman behind it. Um, (laughs) Well, that's what he's trying to find his way to, I think, with Mm. with Mia, who lives downstairs from him. Right. He's very enamored of a woman who lives downstairs, who problematically is a is a pretty successful district attorney. And if she (laughs) ever knows the full scope, like she has hints of that something might be bad, but if she ever knew anything, she'd be beholden under the law to prosecute. <laughs> so it's like this really, you know, in case it's not complicated enough. Walk in the line there. What if Batman had, you know, Jim Gordon living on the premises? Right. Like, oh man. Right. And, and exactly. he happened to be a hot chick. Yeah. Or, he, <laughs> or, you know, or they happen to just like each other anyways. Right. Right. <laughs> Your wife, Delina, you and you have two kids. I've been to your home. It's so family. I mean, it's such a warm family. There's a couple of ridgebacks. There's it's just it's just such a soft kind of place. And you write this like deep, dark stuff. I mean, Stephen King does the same thing. But I wonder if your wife ever is like, okay, like, hey, honey, I'm going to the be with the Navy SEALs. And she doesn't go, will you please come home alive? You know? Well, I think that's why the house, uh, I mean, thank you, first of all. I mean, that's a, that's a nice compliment. But I, I think part of it is people have remarked that crime writers tend to be pretty nice. And I think it's because we're getting all our sublimation in. Like I'm dealing with a lot of dark stuff on the page and in research. And I wonder if having it all live there helps to keep it keep everything else in line you're working it out on the page yeah a i'm working out on the page i'm pretty in touch with my shadow you know to not Mm -hmm. let it you know if you don't keep your eye on it like we can all be horrible pretty quickly right so but you know i kind of got my arms shoved up to the elbows in this stuff for most of the day i'm also aware all the time of how bad things can go quickly in the world which gives me a different sort of perspective on it Look, my, my wife's pretty cool. She's a professor of psychology and she gets it, you know, mm. as a writer when we met and she's not, she's not trying to chip away at who I am. You know, it's <laughs> one of the tenets of our, of our relationship is like, why don't we get married? Cause we, you know, we like each other. So why don't we not chip away at all the things that we actually like about each other? <laughs> like, how about that as a game plan? You know, so yeah. she, some stuff gets nervous, you know, if I'm growing up in a stunt airplane or 
heading off to the jungles of Mexico, mm. but it's she doesn't want to erode that in me. And your kids are like, you're going off to the jungles of Mexico. I want to come. Like, exactly. Your kids have, yeah. have grown up with like, you know, it's not like you can take your child to work day. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. doesn't work like. Well, that. the thing is, is as as you know, 99 days out of 100, it would be the most boring day ever. It's like, all right, <laughs> here I am in my boxers, sit in the corner while I type. You know, <laughs> no one will be admitted into the theater during the riveting typing sequence. I mean, so it's like it's unbelievably boring you know, the vast majority of the time right. for, for, you know, not for me. Cause I'm, I'm in there, you know, typing away, but I've just interviewed Quentin peoples and producer on iron fist. And he said, it's really hard with, you know, with my wife, because I have to explain to her that, you know, I get paid to look out the window mm -hmm. because a lot of the time I'm looking out the window and walking around the garden and trying to come up with ideas you can't explain that to anybody. You can't explain to the kids that they just can you. I know I'm in here, but you I can't know. knock on but the door. Why don't you come with a mute button? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to delineate the space. I mean, I have a pretty clear rule. I got soundproofed office doors, mm. which of course work for everything but my younger kid, who's like, you know, who can get it up there pretty good with volume. <laughs> but I mean, the rule is if I'm in my office, it's like, don't come in, call me. I can't have flying in and it's like, and only call me if someone's on fire. Like it needs to be a fairly, <laughs> you know, but I remember when my, when my youngest was born, we were in, we were in the house. And I remember that's when, if you're not a parent, you never get it when people are like, Oh, they have different cries. Cause you're like, it's a baby. They're all right. babies. Who cares? They scream, they poop. Like there's a, there's a very limited range of stuff that's enormously stimulating. Yeah. But I, I it was funny cause I picked up really quickly on which cry meant what. So it was like 98% of things I could ignore, but there was one where I was like, Oh, she's hurt. Let me get out of my office. Mm. You know? So it's, it's funny how that happens. Cause so that's sort of the rules. I mean, it's great to be home cause I can, I'm home. There's no commute. I don't have to deal with LA traffic. Right. There's a lot of ups. You know, I can see, I can see everyone coming and going, but you know, I also have to know when to kind of turn it off. And there's a part of being a writer or being, you know, an artist of any kind that you have to be selfish. It's a bit like being an athlete. Mm. You have to carve out that time. And, you know, I think one of the things for aspiring writers who are listening, and I'm sure there's a number of them or artists, you have to make that time your own because unlike if you're in another field, no one will do it for you. And so, you know, if you're a doctor and you're in your residency, no one's going to come busting in while you're doing rounds and trying to keep up with things. You know, if you're a accountant in your office during the day, no one's going to come knock on the door and not get it. And so you have to sort of elevate your time creatively, whether it's drawing or writing. You just have to make it sacrosanct because no one will. And you have to and there's always more pressing things. There's mm. always, you know, you got to get groceries. You can got to clean your house. I mean, there's always dozens of things that are more important than working day 87 out of 365 on a novel. You know, so it doesn't pop to the forefront as something essential. So you have to guard it, you know, and so there's a part that you have to be selfish. But, you know, you also have to be kind about it and not get precious and not act like you're an artiste and that, you know, entitles you to a some higher code and more <laughs> like that's also a tricky little slippery slope you know at the end of the day it's not there's nothing more special than if you're doing it's not any harder than if you're i'll take my work day over you know i, I drive by a lot of gardeners who are working really hard right, you know and it's right. like and so there's that end of it of like this is still a privilege and an honor and i'm glad that people read me and like my stuff and there's also the part of it where in terms of the importance and not being able to be disturbed, it's like, I'm also not a surgeon. Hmm. You know, you get a lot of Holly with Hollywood deals. You get a lot of stuff of like, don't tell anyone, but like we have it out. And it's like, it ain't the CIA. Like no one's <laughs> going to get compromised and beheaded by ISIS, you know, if this leaks so that, you know, there, there's some inflation that happens because we all are inherently dramatic people. Right. I mean, hmm. that's what we're doing. We're playing with drama. Right. And so there's a lot, I mean, you know, you can see in the conversation, there's a lot of the stuff that I'm, that I'm kind of working out with Evan, with, you know, with Evan Smoke is like, how do you, how do you try and do something that's, that's, you know, unique and interesting and important to you while also recognizing that you're not unique and interesting and important more than other people and being kind and living in the world in a way that makes sense. Right. Uh, well, you create in the book also this idea that here's this guy who's out doing these things that knows all this stuff. There are more. They're out there. And this sort of concept of 
wow, there could be anybody. People who are trained. Oh, and, the orphans. Yeah. Yeah. Because the orphan program he thought was discontinued. But there's people out. There's other people out there like him. Hmm. Many of whom would be tasked to kill him on site. And maybe some are rogue the way that he is. And so there is a bit of an underlying mythology to it, aside from just, you know, the phone rings and the nowhere man, which is Evan's nickname for his pro bono assassinations, mm. goes to work, you know? Yeah, I remember J. Michael Straczynski's run on Spider-Man. Um, when he came on, it was like such a shocking thing because there you have Spider-Man flying through the city and, you know, he's like doing his thing and he rounds a corner and there's this old guy in a suit barefoot sticking to a wall. And he stops and this guy, Ezekiel, says, hey, hey, Peter, my name's Ezekiel, and shocked. And he says, what, you thought you were the only one? And then it opens up this entire world. Yeah. You know, of course, they threw all that away later on, but it was a great run. It was really wonderful. But the superhero thing of... You're this, building a world. Yes. Yeah. Which means that you have Orphan X, you have Evan Smoke. Anything could happen. You could end up veering off with another character. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of elbow room in there. The mechanics. I just want to quickly talk about the mechanics. Discipline. You're up. You're up early in the morning, and you get to work, and you get you hammering away on your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Do you have break midday? Do you go okay break? I I do now. I used to go straight through, and then at the end, it's always a bit of a problem getting out of my head back into my body at mm. the end of a day, which is why alcohol is good for that. That's why there's a lot of writers <laughs> drink. You know, it's like that's why God made bourbon. Um, but I used to do a workout at the end of my day, and then all these studies came out that were like, hey, if you're sitting all day, it's worse than smoking, and you'll spontaneously just combust. Right. And, right. Know, so it's like so now I try and get out midday and and get in a workout you know, somewhere in the middle, just so mm. that I don't feel like, huh, I've been sitting here for 10 hours with all my blood pooling in my arteries, <laughs> um, or get up and walk the dogs, you know, around the block, that kind of thing. But it's no, it's an, it's all day, every day. Um, you know, I'm up at six, I'm, I'm writing at a minimum, I write till four thirty five every day. Mm. And, you know, if I'm on deadline, it's longer, you know, if I'm, if I have multiple projects, I mean, one time, we had a script that was on a TV show and the threat of shut of, of a show getting shut down looms large because it's, you know, can be a quarter of a million dollars a day. You're shutting down a micro economy. I remember at one point I just sat, I had one 23 hour sitting to write a script and I just sat and typed and they like, you know, brought food in and brought food out and it, you're like a rented mule, you know, it's like, <laughs> keep, how, what, how much life can we get out of it before his front legs buckle? <laughs> Um, you know, and like right now I'm writing a pilot, I'm working in, you know, I, I have a bunch of different things that are happening. And so sometimes the days get longer and, mm. and we book of Henry. Oh yeah. That's well, out. That, that's, that's out next this year. Yeah. It's going to come out in June. I have a movie coming out in June. And that's like an old, that was like years uh, ago. I, uh, I wrote the, I wrote the first draft 18 years ago wow. and it's uh, directed by Colin Trevorrow. It's my little movie. He fit in between Jurassic world and star Wars. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so excited. I mean, I, I, so I literally wrote this almost half a lifetime ago mm. there. I just used literally wrong, but I, I caught myself. <laughs> I wrote it almost half a lifetime ago. Yeah. And that's been cool. And I've been working on a, a, a really cool TV pilot for HBO too. That's mm. an adaptation of black flags about the rise of ISIS. ISIS. And that's been some good dark, some light material. humor. Yeah. There. That, that lightens me up <laughs> in between the nowhere man. And, you know, so you're with TV and film, you've talked about novels, you know, there's a lot of black on a page of white TV and film. There's a lot of white on a page of black. Uh, yeah. I, I must be repeating myself a lot. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah well, you go from 400 pages of final product, you know, in a book to 110 pages with lots of white on the page. You got to move. And, you know, what's so interesting for me is so obviously you have the process in books. You can go into characters heads. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can we really are with Evan. We know what he smells and thinks. And, you know, so but, you know, one of the things I've learned from screenplays is keep the plot moving like pacing. You know, everything's got to matter and you have a little bit more room in novels, but the disciplines can inform themselves or can inform one another. And 
in film, TV, things got to be visual. You have to see them. You got to hang clues. That also applies to novels. Like sometimes I'll read novels and be like, oh, the guy's thinking out the whole solution of the investigation. Mm, or yeah. that's just less fun. But with comics, what was so interesting was like, okay, so now you've gone from this inner world of a novel to let's call it a movie that things are visual and you're rolling a camera. Well, now you're holding the camera and you only get to take three to eight snapshots per page. And so that was really cool. And so all of a sudden it's like, do you want to show the Punisher winding up for a punch? Do you want to show the moment of impact or do you want to show the aftermath? And so it really got me thinking of like, hey, you know what? Sometimes if you just jump into the aftermath and that's where I'm going to take the picture, that's the most compelling from a dramatic perspective. And well, then in you, comics, you're like a director or cinematographer. Oh, yeah. You're but telling then, the artist this shot, this shot, this shot. Yeah, and of course, when you work with you know world-class artists, like I was lucky enough to, David Finch, you know Ethan Van Skyver, Neil Adams, like, mm-hmm. they're going to improve it. It's not like I'm telling them what to do. It's like, <laughs> right. hey, here's, here's the thing. Here's how I see it. I direct it more on the page than I would in, you know, in, in screenplays, you have to fake it. You can't like, there's all these tricks when you're writing where you're like, I'm directing it, but I'm just acting like I'm not like, don't look over here. I mean, right. you don't put the shots in but with comics. You can be much more overt, but you know, those guys improved vastly. I mean, you can't work with a Finch or a Van Skyver without like the game being raised or, you know, Ethan called me at one point and was like, Hey man, let's do like old Marvel style. Like just, so I wrote him almost like screenplay format and was like pages, you know, six through nine here's a bunch of dialogue you know walking down a corridor here's a whole run between people and he did some beautiful stuff um he did there's actually one thing that's a very bantery conversation between bruce wayne and and natalia who's the girlfriend who i i gave him a girlfriend who's a ukrainian pianist and and so there's this kind of conversation they're having that's got some tension and some flair and, and i hope some charm in it and i just gave it to ethan the layout and it's a two page it's two pages and Ethan did this beautiful thing where he did it where it's the keys of a piano with with the black, but mm-hmm. all the panels are the white, you know, the white piano keys because yeah. she's a pianist. And um, it was just amazing. And then I got credit for it. You know, everyone's like, what an amazing. <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, just don't, you know, let's just keep it between me, you and everyone listening to this podcast. <laughs> that, that was all that, that was all him. Um, but, but with screenplay, it's sort of like John Irving, the novelist. He said, do, going from novel to a screenplay, a screenplay is just like a map. You're just, oh, yeah. You're just in, mapping it out. Well, and it's also, I mean, one of the things I realized, so my movie, The Book of Henry, it stars Naomi Watts. Mm-hmm. I remember there's this one speech that I have for her that, that you know, we were working on and reworking, reworking, you know, we came up and you work with somebody as unbelievably talented as her. There's moments when we're shooting where she'll capture so many conflicting emotions in a look that it's like, oh, but all those beautiful words that I just wrote are now irrelevant. <laughs> of course, it's up to Colin what he's going to use and put in the cut. But like it's there you have everything that I spent years working on in a look, but mm. she can't get to that look unless I spend years doing it. So there's this interesting aspect to it where a screenplay, it's, you know, it's partially a map. I, I have a huge amount of respect for the, for, screenwriters facing the blank page and that's what we do but it's like it's a roadmap it's an invitation to collaborate Mm. you have actors show up whose only job is to think about everything from just the perspective of that one character right and to inhabit that character from 360 degrees and so when i have when we got a jacob tremblay a sarah silverman dean nor i mean the cast was amazing uh maddie ziegler Jaden lieben i mean just great people come and they need to do their job and they need to come and bring the kind of richness that they have devoted their lives to perfecting, mm. you know? So it, it's it's a very interesting process, you know? And it, it's not unlike, you know, working with, you know, I, I reference Finch and Vince Skyver a lot because it was like, that was, you know, we did the, this kind of my scarecrow and my Mad Hatter stories. And and Simon Kudransky, who did my art on, mm. on Penguin was, yeah. was amazing. Um but, you know, it's it's not dissimilar where, like, I kind of get it all out. And then, I you know, I usually had, like, sort of a call with, with Ethan and, and, and David, uh, great guys to work with. And we kind of talk through and, you know, here's this, here's that. And, you know, Finch might be like, hey, man, you're like from a storytelling perspective, visually, we need another beat here. And I might come in at this angle. And, you know, I might. Did you do it via Skype or just phone? I, or? We just call it, talked. Yeah. Right, right. 
We don't need to look at each other. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because that thing with comics where you're deciding what to show, I found incredibly useful in novels. Like there's a lot of scenes that I'll end on the verge of violence. And I don't need to describe the violence. I don't mm. need to get graphic. It's creepier that way. And so it's one of the things with comics really taught me that or reinforced because I knew it, you know, to a certain extent, all the more that what you leave out is as important as what you show because mm. there's, you know, you're so limited. What are we going to show? You know, you cut to a room with a shattered skylight at the feet and three guys knocked out and blood all over the walls and Batman's kind of hunched over breathing hard. Mm. That's a cool opening to a scene, not necessarily the end of a scene. Right. You can skip the whole flying through the skylight we've seen a million times. Right. right. So there's there's all these ways in of like, how do I jump into a scene? How do I back into a scene? How do I come upside down into a scene, you know, with novels, with movies, with everything? Just having interviewed Carl Gottlieb, writer of Jaws. Yeah, he's done some stuff. He's done a few things. Yeah. He was saying on Jaws that he was there punching up the script and, you know, doing what he was there to do. And this it was all about the monster and mm -hmm. the monster, the monster was a lot of monster stuff. And then the monster stopped working mm -hmm. and stopped working and stopped working. And it was like everybody else was doing their work and it was all about them. And then the monster stopped working and Spielberg looked at him and said, your turn. Yeah, that's great. And he was like, yeah. okay, I'm getting yeah. to work because it's, it's all about the people and what you don't see. Oh. And that makes it so much more upsetting. You right. know, if I end a scene where somebody picks up in a, a torture implement and walks into a room and closes the door behind him and I just leave it, don't describe <laughs> anything else, what the reader will conjure up will be from all of their worst fears and problems. And same mm. with emotional scenes, you know, with, with scenes with positive emotion. If you allude to something, if you point your, uh, you know, a smart pop culturally aware readership, you want to, you give an elbow point in a direction, mm. what they can dream up is way more compelling than what I'm going to confine on the page. So a lot of the language is, is sort of suggestive, right? You want to kind of reference what the emotions are that people should be feeling. Well, you kind of did that in Orphan X. There's a scene with Evan Smoke. Who he's sort of looking at this woman. There's a child in the next room. He's kind of seeing her and you're describing what he sees and it's definitely titillating and sort of like he just sort of doesn't know what to do with this this emotion and as a reader you're going wow what the hell is going to happen is he going to follow through this what does that look like mm -hmm. when a guy like him lets himself be vulnerable is he is he able to yeah and i think if you allude to things i mean it's such an intimate relationship between a novelist and a reader in a certain way because you know if i let's say I sell a million copies of orphan x of the, mm -hmm. and a million copies of the nowhere man there's a million different movies that play in a million different people's heads mm -hmm. it's not confined everyone brings all of their you know triumphs and tragedies and shortcomings and flaws and all of the weight of their lives and all of the weight of their emotional lives to the story and mm. reconstructed in their head so it's like the the nowhere man that you read is different from the one that you know your neighbor reads or your friend reads or the other people in your book club read or your librarian reads <laughs> we all build it you know so part of the job is to have people to give people all the tools and 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 and, and the suggestion that if yes i want it to be riveting i want it to be a page turner i want people to say i read it in two weeks i didn't sleep i hate you i love those emails mm. But you also want to make sure that everyone has enough to grab hold of to build that version of the story in their head that's theirs. They hear their own voices. Yeah. Again, like John Irving and Prayer for Owen Meany, there's Owen Meany who's this all, – it's all about the voice. He writes in all caps just for that character and he's this tiny little character and everybody talks about his voice. Mm -hmm. Everybody who reads it hears it in a different way. Some hear it high pitch, some hear it you know, low pitch, some – and it creates a, a, a real personal experience. Mm -hmm. I guess every reading every novel is sort of a personal experience, but it's different going to a movie and hearing an actor's voice and everybody knows it's a Tom Hanks movie. It's yeah, well, and it's interesting because I remember when, you know, I did some Wolverine. I did the first annual. I did some other stuff. But I remember after casting, you know, after the movie was made, Wolverine started looking a bit like Hugh Jackman. You know, <laughs> and he's, he, he's not a big, tall, broad guy, right? Right. right. He, generally. But, you know, he starts getting the sideburns going and, you know, and, and, 
the facial structure and, yep. it, you know, it starts to be contained in a way. So it shifts. We all have a relationship. These characters are all in a public trust. It's like when I'm writing Batman, I'm not owning Batman, you know, because you got Scott Snyder. You have all these other people doing it. You have all the people who came before you who are doing it. Mm. And you also have all these people that it's a piece of their life growing up right you have, you have older fans you have kids everyone has their own thing and so you're trying to it's a bit of a tightrope walk because you want to i always wanted to give whether it was marvel or dc i wanted to give them something that was new that was of me but mm. it's also a tightrope walk because you you need to honor what those essential characteristics are that make that character that character so it's like how are you fresh and new and interesting but not leaning too hard you're jumping into a mythology rather than creating one uh, sort of like you yeah, say, honoring what's come before. Yeah, and that, that's really important. It's funny because I played with it a bit. And those were some of people's favorite scenes where I got a little meta with Batman in a couple of scenes. <laughs> like, I, you know, the, there's a dark scene that I did. I want to say this was in the with the Van Skyver run on the Mad Hatter where, you know, it's the dark late at night and Jim Gordon's in his office and all of a sudden the curtain flares and Batman's there and they're talking and then Jim's thinking and he goes over by the window and he's talking for two panels and you only see him and he goes, this is where I turn, this is the part where I turn around and you're no longer here, right? And there's a blank panel and then Batman goes, nope. <laughs> and then they turn around and they both look at each other awkwardly and then Batman kind of awkwardly exits in the next panel. And like readers love that because it was like, it was so funny. It was like, what's the one time where, you know, like Jim, because, you know, it's sort of fun to live in a world where you're like everyone, let's just assume everyone's read a bunch of Batman, yeah. including Jim Gordon and Batman. Like right, they know right, the right. drill too, you know? That's why year one was so good because you see Batman like tripping over his cape. Yeah. You know, he just started. He's going to yeah. figure out what works and what doesn't. Right. We do love those moments. Anyway, hey, this was a, a sharp thriller of an interview this was great it sailed along and i really appreciate you coming and doing this hey everybody orphan x is out the nowhere man is out you need to go and read it for all of you comic fans out there who like to read things without pictures this is a place to go you're going to get some super superhero thriller adventure tropes that you enjoy out of your comic books in here and you're going to like comics it's going to leave you wanting more so go check it out. They are out now. Also, The Reigns is out, which is a young adult horror novel of all things, like as if you didn't have enough to do. All these things you certainly can find in our shop here in North Hollywood on Lancashire Boulevard. Uh, we carry these books. And go to uh, your phone and dial 855 the number 2 nowhere and see what happens on the other side i've never felt more like a radio show when i just did that <laughs> that was pretty it's great legit. it is it's legit. legit and so are you thanks man i really appreciate you coming by yeah great to see you the blast off podcast is produced by the colonel jeff fox scott tipton and me original music is composed and performed by Derek anthony gray you can find more of his musical compositions on his website, DerekAnthonyGray.com. For more information about anything you've heard us talk about today, check us out online at BlastOffComics.com. We have an active Facebook presence, so check us out over there on Facebook. And you can reach us on Twitter, at BlastOffComics, or on Instagram. Or you can come by our retail location in North Hollywood in the heart of the Arts District, 5118 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, just two blocks south of Magnolia. See you soon.